when we think about the Russian classics, broadly we're talking about two different categories, the 19th century and the 20th century, so pre-Russian Revolution and post-Russian Revolution. When we're looking at the 19th century, mainly they're impacted by the Enlightenment and also the Napoleonic period. So with the Enlightenment, it's a loss of religion, searching more for purpose, for morality, and falling into nihilism. And the impact of Napoleon is largely onto the idea of ambition and the right of one person to dominate and assert their will over another. When we're looking at the 20th century, we're very much focusing on the consequences of the Russian Revolution. So looking at more at freedom, particularly freedom of thought, looking towards the power and the corruptibility of ideologies, and also turning more towards materialism. And starting with the 19th century, or really talking about these two giants of all classic literature, we have Tolstoy and we have Dostoevsky, who are contemporaries of each other. Tolstoy would largely write about the meaning of life, whereas Dostoevsky was more exploring how virtues survive in a vice-ridden or a cruel world. And that's really quite a simplified way of understanding all of Dostoevsky's novel. He takes the virtue and he places it within a character and he puts them into a cruel world and sees how they do. So if we take the idiot, we have the innocence of Prince Mishkin. If we have crime and punishment, we have the ambition and the intellectual drive of Raskolnikov. If we look at Brothers Karamazov, we have the faith of Alyosha. And then if we look at demons, we have the love of Shatov. So broadly speaking, that is how these books can be understood in a very, very stripped down manner. But those are the arguably central themes or the central virtues. And then it's how do they do in a cruel world? Can they survive? Are they enough? And will they fulfill the need, as mentioned in The Idiot, of beauty to save the world? Beauty being these virtues or the virtues that are being tested in those instances. Are they sufficient? However, when we turn to Tolstoy and we have this question of the meaning of life, again, it can be looked at in a fairly simplified manner in the sense that Tolstoy takes one character and he uses them to explore meaning in life, to explore purpose. And in War and Peace, we have that character being Pierre. In Anna Karenina, we have the character being Levin. And so if you're reading these books and you want to understand the philosophy behind them, a good starting point can be those two characters. What are they doing? What's their journey? What are they saying? Both authors have also written shortened versions of these philosophical inquests. So for Tolstoy, we have the death of Ivan Ilyich. And for Dostoevsky, we have notes from the underground. And they really present a stripped back and a much shortened version of the fundamental beliefs, or not, not necessarily beliefs, but fundamental philosophies of the two authors. So in Notes from the Underground, we're very much exploring the cruelty of the individual, but that can be manifested in the entire community, entire society. And that could be, so Notes from the Underground could arguably be looked at as the setting that the virtuous characters are placed in, or the arguably virtuous characters are placed in. Whereas in Death of Ivan Ilyich, it is very much an inquest into the meaning of life. And Ivan becomes another character like Pierre, like Levin, who explores what is the meaning of life. But here we have a very strong focus on three areas, although they might be the most dominant areas. And that is family, that is work, and that is the material or the possessions around you. So if you wanted a primer on both of these authors, those could be great starting points. However, the way I did it was, well, I read the novels by them quite a lot earlier than I read these two short stories. I started with the novels and it was interesting to read the shorter versions, Notes from the Underground and The Death of Ivan Ilyich, just to update and be able to make my ideas about the philosophies a bit more concrete. So I think either way around is fine. To be honest, for Tolstoy, maybe the Cossacks, if you just wanted to sort of dip your foot in the water, the Cossacks would be a better start with Tolstoy as it still has some of the charms of the larger works and also follows the, the main themes and the main structures towards to a Tolstoy novel although I'd say the Cossacks is almost like a a short excerpt from War and Peace really it could fit in quite nicely there but honestly I would just start with Tolstoy with the longer novels they're really not as daunting as people think Anna Karenina especially it's easy to read because Tolstoy is such a great writer the only difficulty really is that it's so long and it's the making the commitment to to read it and consistently go back to it but if you're fine with that if you just want to give it a go I really urge you to. Tolstoy is a very accessible author, much more so than Dostoevsky. I wouldn't say Dostoevsky is, well, he's not easy. Dostoevsky is not insurmountable. And if you do want a shortened version or a lighter touch of Dostoevsky, I would say read some of his short stories. White Knights in particular is very not Dostoevsky. It's much lighter, much more lighthearted. Not that there isn't humor in Dostoevsky's longer novels. It's just, it's a bit of dark humor. 
and it's hard to notice when he's being funny and when it's just cruelty. So short stories, White Nights, I think is a good starting point if you just want to have a taste of Dostoevsky before you commit to something longer. The other authors whose names you may be familiar with are Pushkin and Chekhov. Both write in short formats and their characters tend to be defined by vices. Pushkin, I think, is fantastic. Everything he does is great. All of his short stories I highly recommend, no matter what sort of version that you pick up, just any collection by him. I really wish there were more Pushkin stories, longer stories. I would love that. I also definitely recommend his epic poem or narrative verse, Eugene Onegin. I think it is a wonderful investigation of nihilism and how virtues can overrule us and then the regret that come, sorry, how vice can overrule us and then the regret that, that comes later on. And this is coming from someone who really doesn't enjoy epic poetry or narrative verse, but Eugene Onegin, I thought it was great. Then in regards to Chekhov, it's a similar story in that his short stories are fantastic. I think the lady with the little dog, or the lady with the lap dog, and the grasshopper are two of my favourites. Most of Chekhov's vice focus is on lust and infidelity. So, I know, <laughs> that that's, tends to be what he focuses on. Whereas I say Pushkin is a bit more varied in terms of the vices that he pursues. So a bit more greed, a bit more idleness, etc. Whereas Chekhov, most of his stories are focused on love. And that is his modus operandi. But still, very compelling. There is enough variety between them also. Because you'd think that all of these short stories just about love could get a bit boring, but no, good variety. Really enjoy reading all of them. However, I really do not like Chekhov's plays. I found them very wooden in terms of dialogue. I found them very similar in terms of plot, that there just wasn't enough variation. Maybe it was reading them back to back, five of them back to back, that it just wasn't enjoyable, there was too much repetition. Maybe they're better performed, I don't know, but Chekhov's short stories, 100%, his plays, not something I enjoy. And I don't mind reading plays, I really enjoy reading Shakespeare, but I don't know, these ones just weren't for me. And then we can move on to some lesser known authors of the, of the 19th century, and to be honest, they might hold some of the best works. And first up is Turgenev's Fathers and Sons, which is a short book, only about 200 pages, but it is maybe one of the best explorations of nihilism that I've read. And it makes a very compelling case for nihilism, which I think is how you know that it's well-written. Well, for me, it's how I know that it's well-written because I have no calling towards nihilism. And yet, the way that Turgenev writes, you see the rationale behind it. And it's just incredibly well done, even better than some of Dostoevsky's explorations of nihilism, particularly within Demons. I think Fathers and Sons fast passes that. Not fast passes that, but it's... I found it a better presentation of that. Perhaps more concise. So there's a chapter in particular which really, really lays out the argument in a discussion between um, someone of the younger generation and someone of the older generation. And that's really the crux of the novel, is that it explores those intergenerational relationships and how the parents can look at their children with horror and the children look at their parents with mockery. And it's always relevant. You always see this gap or this chasm between between parents and between children and I think it's a wonderful exploration of that. Next we have Nikolai Gogol who wrote Dead Souls and Gogol is someone who's been classed as similar to Tolstoy and Dostoevsky and was also a influence for um, Mikhail Bulgakov and I really enjoyed Dead Souls. I thought it was a fantastic book and such an interesting premise. Basically someone's going out and asking landowners to buy their serfs who are dead but are legally still alive by the state standards or from the from the census records and we see how the different landowners react to that proposition it's very interesting it's a very funny story and very cleverly worked out and i really wish i could recommend it but the problem is that before gog died he burnt the second half of the manuscript and it was published posthumously so we only have fragments of the second half of the novel and it just ends mid-sentence as well. There's a lot of stuff that has to be filled in by the translator and by the publisher. And it's a real shame because while it's a fantastic setup and you can, the story's not incoherent. You can sort of follow what's going on in the second half, but it's incomplete. It does ruin it a little bit or ruin it quite a bit. So I don't know if I can really recommend it. Although I really enjoyed it and 
it's a shame. Finally, we have Ivan Gontrov's Oblomov. And this might be my pick of the lot of them. And that's for quite personal reasons. So I don't think it would be as appealing to everybody. But essentially, it's a character, Oblomov, who has Oblomovitis. Which basically is that he doesn't want to do anything. He wants to lie in bed all day. He wants to mope around. He doesn't want to get dressed. And he's happy to live in squalor. So we have that explanation of sloth and idleness. But we also have a fantastic exploration of the archetype of the mother. And the two women that really play a strong role within the life of Oblomov. We have one who is the nurturing mother. Who pushes him and wants him to be better. Wants him to come out, wants him to come out of his shell and be alive again. And then we also have the woman who we meet later on in the book. Who is the overbearing mother. Who just wants to attend to him. Doesn't want to push him. But wants to take care of all of his needs. And he doesn't have to lift a finger. And we have those two, two parallels which are brilliantly laid out, the nurturing and the overbearing mother, or the nurturing and the overbearing female. So if you're interested in archetypes and the sort of meta stories, then I think this is a great book that goes into those two. It also is a warning for procrastinators and people who need a bit of a, bit of a kick to get started. I think it really presents where the descent can go if you don't work hard enough, or if you don't attend to your knowledge that you are a procrastinator, which perhaps is why I was so drawn to it. That I can tend towards that. So while it doesn't necessarily provide a cure for oblomovitis, it does provide a warning before things get too late. And that's about it for the 19th century. Those are all of the authors that I would recommend and found compelling from that period. If I had to pick the best few, I would say, so from Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, I think Tolstoy it would be Anna Karenina. From Dostoevsky, it would probably be The Idiot. I think that was the one that I enjoyed the most. I think it's got one of the better introductions of a Tolstoy novel. It's easier to get to grips with the plot and what's going on. I, from the others, I think if you're interested in nihilism, then yes, I would re recommend Turgenev's Fathers and Sons. If not, I think that is the main draw of the novel, so maybe not necessarily. Again, Gogol, he's got that problem with the, with the finishing of it. I think Chekhov, yes. Pushkin, yes. Any of their short stories. And... Oblomov, if it sounds interesting to you, if it appeals to you, then would 100% recommend, but not for everybody. Have a Pushkin, Chekhov, Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, I think everybody should read. They really are well known for a reason. And then going on to the 20th century, we had a few crazy things going on at the, in the first two decades of the 20th century. Not just the, the First World War, but we also had the Russian Revolution. And then as for some of the authors, we also had the Second World War as well. So a lot of material to, to build on, let's say. And the chasm the religion left in the, for the 19th century in those authors is filled now by ideology, which brings with it mass censorship. So a lot of these works weren't published until a lot later or published abroad when they were smuggled out. And it also brings out the new themes that we had. So more to do with finding freedom. And one of the best explanations of that is Mikhail Bulgakov's Master and Margarita. And this is a satirical work which involves the devil coming to Moscow. And he is mocking them as, he's, as they believe that now they are freed from religion, they can think freely under the Soviet regime. However, they soon find that the devil is playing with their lives. It's a wonderful piece of satire of the all-seeing, all-knowing Soviet state preying upon its citizens. In Life and Fate by Vasily Grossman, we see the building upon of these ideas, but grounded more in reality. And the setting for the novel, or the main theme or the main event going on in the background, similar to how the Napoleonic War is going on in the background of War and Peace, we have the battle for Stalingrad in Life and Fate. And it is the perfect backdrop for this novel. Stalingrad's main appeal or main territorial advantage was the symbology of it. It was very much ideologically driven. It represented the heartland of Russia and Stalin to both the Soviets and to the Nazis. And all of those bodies and all of those men were thrown at it and died as a result because of this ideological bent and because of the symbolism behind it, not the real substance behind it. And it's such a fantastic analogy for the two regimes and for ideology in general. And beyond that, Grossman gives us an insight into the daily lives as well and the fear that individual citizens had that the state could make or could break their lives. And it's a, it's a terrible sight to behold. And the pinnacle of this exploration is really Alexander Solzhenitsyn in his book, well, primarily the Gulag Archipelago, which is a non-fiction account of the horrors and the atrocities that went on in the Soviet Union, particularly the side of the regime that sent citizens to the gulags in their droves. However, we also have his book, Cancer Ward, which is similar to Life and Fate in that the setting is just perfect. 
the backdrop for Life and Fate is Stalingrad, and in Cancer Ward it is a Cancer Ward, which is a brilliant analogy for the for the Russian state, both in what is trying to be cured, but also the dismal setting and just the inevitability of death within that. And the final book of the 20th century is one that really stands alone, and that is Lolita by Nobokov. And perhaps that could be a testament to Nobokov to write a book that is so discomforting and so perverse that it stands alone on the list. And some would say that a book of this nature shouldn't be written or read or printed, but then that would just leave us naive to the realities of the world. It's a book which focuses on the corporeal, a descent into materialism, and the breaking down of boundaries between the adult world and the child world, particularly in regards to sexualization. It's a disturbing read, but perhaps an essential one, and it could be seen as a juxtaposition to the thought crimes that were punished in the Soviet Union, or many times crimes which are just made up by the state. And in this case, we have crimes which are certainly worthy of punishment within Novikov's Lolita. It's a book that I didn't know if I wanted to in include on this list, as it doesn't really fit into to any of the others, and that juxtaposition, I suppose, is slightly forced, perhaps. But I do think it's a significant book. I do think it's important to read, and it certainly has themes and ideas that are real, and that we all should be aware of. There's no use hiding from something and pretending it doesn't exist. Much better to confront it. But those are the books from the 19th and 20th century from the Russian authors that I would recommend. If you're interested in 20th century history, I would highly recommend both Solzhenitsyn and Grossman. They're a bit more grounded in reality. Have you do prefer more satirical takes, then I think Master of Margarita is fantastic. It could be a modern book. It's very well written, very witty, very funny. And if I had to pick three from all of them, they would all be from the 19th century. That's my favourite. And it would be Oblomov, it would be The Idiot, and it would be Chekhov's short stories. You can't miss with any of them. They're all great. Hope you enjoyed that. See you in the next one.